Article 2. Spelling Exceptions, Problems or Possibilities. The problem with answering the why is English like this working with a student is that they aren't going to care about the long and short vowel sounds and what people who invented printing presses preferred. To me, this is all fascinating, which is why I pursued a degree in TESOL. But I've never found that kids or adults ever cared about the why behind the rules of English. The sheer number of people my age who couldn't care less about spelling and grammar is appalling, but quite telling. I've heard many people say, well, you understood what I meant, didn't you, when arguing with me about spelling or usage. I'm one of those people who prefers preserving the rules. I like the explanation of the soft G sound, which requires the inclusion of the E to make it soft. Page 374. That seems to be an easy rule you can explain to someone much better than the typesetter preferred using TCH. I identified with the quote, capable readers and spellers respond to patterns rather than rules, and those patterns more accurately captured the complexity of English, page 377. As someone who has been learning a complex foreign language for the last seven years, I fully appreciate the idea of patterns and recognition. Reading and speaking as well as exposure to the language in general has been the most helpful in learning. That's why it's so important for people to read. We spend so little time on doing that as kids. Without repeated exposure, how will they learn? Article three, learning to use an alphabetic writing system. What I noticed from working with younger children who write only vowels is that they don't understand what consonants make what sounds. Similarly, I found that kids who omitted vowels had the same problem. They could tell that the word they wanted to write was ball and would spell it B-L-L -L because they didn't know which vowel sound made the A-W, aw sound. In this article, it talks about how kids would write without consonants. Never seen that happen. When you constantly review the sounds each letter makes, the kids better able are better able to guess at the letter. It just seems to take a ton of repetition. I sort of understand, and yet don't at the same time, the idea that kids will try to spell a word using the letters from their own name. Spelling horse, M-A-T-H-W, when your name is Matthew, just doesn't make sense. It would only make sense if the child understood letters to stand in for a word they think they are thinking about. In other words, letters are just a picture for what I want to write. In that case, I would think that this child would use M-A-T-H-W to spell everything. Surely he must see that horse, house, car, cat, and dog can't all be spelled M-A-T-H-W. The article also goes on to talk about kids being exposed to T-H as a popular combination, and yet almost every child they worked with in kindergarten could not identify T-H in the, let alone write it. If they see it so often, why can't they reproduce it? I had to giggle at the usage of the word pin as an example of changes in sound. I imagine a Southern teacher trying to teach an E&L student the difference between pin and pen when they sound the same with a Southern twang. And how do you teach a student here in Buffalo that is M-I-L-K milk, not M-E-L-K milk, or E-G-G -G egg, not A-G-G -G egg? Again, exposure and correction. That's why learning a foreign language is so hard. You don't get practice in school when learning French. You get an exam at the end of the year to try and use those words you learned as exercises. I've never understood it. The usage of context clues helps in English and also for me while learning Korean. The word apple, for example, is the same as the word for apology. They're spelled the same, but used differently in different contexts. That's also a strategy we use with readers all of the time. Look at the sentences around a word to decipher its meaning and context. The idea that children will learn on their own is interesting. They learn from their environment and what they see and hear from friends and adults. To me, that is why there is such a large cultural gap in our culture and code switching exists. In the words their way text, it suggests learners group words to learn sounds. I have noticed in my district in the past, they have worksheets for students where they practice clusters of words. I see the benefit, but I've also noticed it becomes a habit of knowing you have to write an E in the blank for every word, met, pet, set, let. They don't learn it because they know it's the same for each answer. The Rosetta Stone reveals the hidden logic behind students' invented spellings. I had to laugh at that one. It's not for deciphering hieroglyphics. Has anyone told the world this? Do scholars agree? Anyway, one of the ways I saw manipulators being used was when I saw the kindergartners using tiles to spell words and fill in a sheet. They had to dig through a box to find the tiles and make the words. It was part of what is called stations. They would walk around to each station where they would get different opportunities to work with letters and words. According to the text on page four, this allows the students to learn patterns and conventions. What I find interesting is that if this man found this information back in 1971, why was my generation never taught about short and long vowel sounds and the rules associated with word, why, why words are formed as they are? I never learned any of that and I took, didn't, I never learned any of that until I took linguistic classes in college 40 years later. I didn't even learn them during my eight years of French classes. I won awards in first grade for my reading abilities. 
how if I was never explicitly taught the rules? The text states that the relationship between specific knowledge and knowledge of the system is reciprocal, which allows people to remember the difference between which and which on page five. But that doesn't seem to hold true. People of every age cannot seem to remember the difference between words like two, two, and two, nor can they tell when to use effect or effect, affect or effect. They have been taught, so why do they keep making mistakes over and over again? Anyway, the point of, the, of this chapter is to say that watching kids' mistakes allows us to customize their, customize their word study to target what needs reinforcement. In my T-cell studies, we consistently worked with prefixes and suffixes, as well as cognates when working with students. Cognates are obviously not the same as prefixes and suffixes, which have meaning associated with them, but they help you else to make those connections. What I think my school district does well is to reinforce reading with elementary school kids. They're cons constantly reading and taking books home. They try to get the kids to read with, read with sustained and silent reading every Friday at the high schools, but I know that tends not to work very well. The sheer number of students I have watched doing everything but read is comical. One exercise I did with my e &L students was to have them write down or take pictures of words they saw in their daily life. We would talk about those wor words and explore their usage and spelling. We kept a journal of those words and a word wall so we could revisit those words consistently. This gives them a hands-on experience as the text recommends, but in a more immediate and applicable way, page eight. Finally, the text mentions how from adolescence on, except perhaps for slang, most of the new vocabulary, vocabulary students learn comes from reading and reflects new domains of content-specific knowledge that students explore on page 25. This would explain why so many of the high school students I teach have abysmal vocabularies. I would be interested in reading a study about the spelling, writing, and reading habits of high schoolers, since that's who I teach, and the effects of screens, texting, and shorthand social media writing on their writing. I taught summer school, and Google Docs can only correct so much, but I found that a large majority of my students completely ignored the squiggly lines in Google and kept going anyway. These ninth and 10th graders were shockingly low level. It would seem that the text is correct that students only learn when they are exposed to content specific words, but I think it needs to go a step further to include whether or not the students care. Exposing them to new words is great, but they won't learn unless they want to.